And so if you see one of our youth, ask them any question about communion. And, they, and here's the deal. Parents, I need you to make some food for us. We need some lunch. We, need, we, have, some, we have dessert taken care of more of lunch taken care of. So if you can help with that, see me after church today and we'll work that out. The senior dinner is next Sunday, October 20th, following worship. And they're asking, the folks putting on, the deacons putting that on, are asking for if you're going to be there, please sign up today so they know how much food to get. It's out in the table, the small round table out by the doors in Galbraith Hall. If you're interested in becoming a member of First Presbyterian Church, we have a new member class coming Saturday, November 2nd. Lunch and child care will be provided. Once again, there's a sign-up sheet for that on the table in Galbraith Hall. We need you to sign up for that today as well. Presbytery is meeting here on November 2nd, which is a Tuesday. We need people to bake pies. Any pie but pumpkin is what is being asked for. So if you could bake a pie or two or three, please sign up in Galbraith Hall for that as well. Last week, you heard me talk about the t-shirts that are being made for our church with our new mission statement, His Light in the City, and the design. You'll see the design up there. Well, if you are interested in those, they're coming. We, we put in some sizes. All our kids and our youth are getting free shirts, and then one adult per family is getting a free shirt, but there will be opportunities for adults to buy more. So know that those are coming. They're coming soon. Uh, they've been ordered, correct? So they've been ordered. They're on their way. It's been a really generous donation from someone in our congregation for these T-shirts. So get your T-shirts, wear them out proudly, and broadcast the news of First Presbyterian Church. Um, the winter safety um, class or is going to be done by the mission committee where they're going to check people's cars and make sure that they're safe for the winter. That's going to happen October 19th here at the church. If you, are, if you have any questions about that, see someone from the mission committee. Applebee's Dining to Donate is today. So after church, go to Applebee's, have lunch. And if you grab one of the flyers in Galbraith Hall and take it there, 15% of your check will be donated to the Pittsburgh Food Bank. So today is a great day to eat at Applebee's. So that is all for me. Let's worship God.
you'll join me by standing as we do the call to worship. Welcome today to a celebration of God's love. We are grateful for this welcome. Each one of us is different. We are unique individuals. The Lord will make us one in worship. We come from various backgrounds. We come with different needs and dreams. Though we travel different paths of struggles and successes. The Lord will make us one in healing and hope. The Lord calls us to worship in unity. Praise be to God who blesses our diversity and our unity. Let us worship God.
the gospel calls us to turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another by praying the responsive prayer of confession, which is printed in your bulletin and projected on the wall. Lord Jesus, you have commanded us to love you with all our hearts, with all our souls, and with all our minds. But we confess that we have not been yours of the Lord. Our hearts have not fully loved you, but loved the unclean things of this world more. You have commanded us to love our neighbors as ourselves. But we confess that we have not been yours of the Lord. Our mouths have been slow to bring comfort and grace to others in our lives. You have commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in your name and teaching them to obey your law. We confess that we have not been of your word. Our feet have not been to go out and carry your good news and peace. Lord, hear us as we silently confess the many ways that we have been hearers but not doers of the word. We, along with David, have confessed our transgressions to the Lord, and he has forgiven the iniquity of our sin. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The Spirit of God has given us many gifts, one of which is peace. The peace given to us by the Spirit comes only when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior and allow the Spirit to guide us every day and in every way. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, let us share the peace that passes all understanding with one another. How about now? Look at that, the magic. It has returned. Hi, welcome. Can you say hello? Give me a Newcastle welcome. How do you do that? Say, hi, Reverend Moore. Can you do that? 
That works. That works. Well, it's great to be here. It's wonderful to be down at your church today. What do you want to tell me? What did he do? Okay. Well, I, I come from New Wilmington, which is just up the road a little ways. And perhaps some of you have visited New Wilmington. And, or maybe you've been to the Apple Castle. Have any of you gone to the Apple Castle? Yeah? Uh, did you go yesterday? They had all kinds of things going on at the Apple Castle yesterday. Yeah. Day before yesterday? Well, I went yesterday after they were closed because I was busy all day. And they had this apple shooter thing on a rubber band, and you just pulled it back and shot apples trying to hit some moving targets. I think I could have done that all day, except I didn't have time, and I ran out of apples. Disappointing. Well, that was like a gift to me because I needed to have something to, to relax with. But I brought a gift for you today. Can you imagine that? Show up at church and you get a gift. Well, here's your gift. I'm going to give you a cup. And you can take this cup and you can keep this cup. And if there's anyone else who's little who wants to come up and get a cup because now they realize there's a gift and they want to have something, uh, I think that that's important. Here's a gift for you because I think you need one. Here's another gift for you because I think it's important to have one. There's one for you. I think you two young ladies need a cup. Anyone else need a cup that doesn't have a cup? Uh, make sure I don't run out first. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm not a very good thrower. Oh, here's a cup for you. You can't be left out. Now, the reason these... Oh, I have two cups left. One's going to Bob, and one's going over here. No, I need one first. I'll give you this one after I use it. Now, this, just, this isn't just a cup. This is, a, this is an amazing cup. And the reason this is an amazing cup is because I want you to be reminded of God's love with this cherished cup. Now, on the cup, by the way, for those of you that can't see it, I'm marketing Westminster College. That's what I do. And, but I also offer, uh, I market my office, the Office of Faith and Spirituality, because I'm the minister at Westminster College. And so I have the honor and the privilege of bringing God and God's love to college students. So today I want to bring that love to you. Now, if you look at your cup, what's it missing? What are you, what's your cup missing? A drink. A drink. What's a cup without a drink? Because you could be thirsty on a nice warm morning like this, couldn't you? So I, I have some water. Now I want you to check out my cup, this beautiful cup. Oh my gosh. My cup turned blue. By the way, Westminster College, blue and white. Marketing the college. Isn't that kind of neat? So, but what I want you to know about this cup is that when we pour God's love into our heart, the water, the living water comes out through the love of Jesus for us. And so whenever you take a drink out of this special cup, I want you to be reminded that God loves you. Now, to do that, I'm going to take a risk. Not all of you, because if you didn't come forward, you don't get water. Yeah, this is just water. How come yours turns blue? Well, let's see if yours turns blue. Mine's turning blue. It's just an amazing thing. Guys, mine turned blue. Mine's turning blue. The love of Jesus Christ in your heart through the gift of water and through the gift of a cup. Now, Jesus' love can change us forever, just like this water changes. Now, taste the water for me. Does it taste any different? Everybody take a drink. Mm. As long as you don't spill it on yourself, it's a good thing. It's good. Well, be careful with your cups, but I want you to pray with me before you go back to your seats. Could you do that? Okay. I'm going to pray a phrase, and then I want you to say back to me what I say. So when I say, dear God, you say, dear God. Okay, so let's pray together. Dear God, we give thanks to you for your love, a love that can come to us 
and is present always and can change us just like this color of this cup has changed. So for your love we give thanks and together we say amen. Thank you so much for coming forward and enjoy your cups. Keep them, enjoy them, share them. And for those of you that didn't come forward, guess what? I'm coming to you. Join me in prayer. Lord, as we seek your wisdom and guidance and turn to your word, let us open our hearts, our minds, and our ears as we hear it. May your words prompt us to be not only hearers of the word, but let us prompt us to move out of this place and be doers of all that you have planned for us. Through Christ who lives in us, amen. This morning's scripture lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 26. It can be found on page 1219 in your Pew Bible or will be projected on the wall. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all are made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be our sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we stow, bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Which of our more presentable parts do not require do not require, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. This is the word of the Lord. Is it my turn? That's your <laughs> Again, greetings. I uh, bring you greetings from Westminster College, where I'm the chaplain, and our president, uh, Rick Dorman, and our board of trustees, and especially our students. Whenever I visit a congregation, which is often, I always ask if there's a Westminster connection. So is there anyone here who 
uh, maybe attended Westminster College. Oh. Woohoo! Go Titans! I can tell you that they won yesterday, so that's a good thing. We celebrate that. And uh, how about anyone send a child to Westminster College? You didn't attend there, but you sent a child. Thank you. I hope you're still paying your bills so that they can continue to pay folks like me to do ministry there. So, uh, but thank you. It, it's, it's always fun to come and worship with a congregation where I see a few folks that I recognize. Um, it's a joy to be here today because my old, old, old friend, Steve Pryden, is here. And I, you need to know, I've known Steve longer than any of you have known Steve, I'm guessing. Steve grew up as my cousin's neighbor, and so we often played in the neighborhood together as kids. And so it was such a joy several years ago to come here for one of your Lenten uh, luncheons, I think, and look up, and there's Steve standing on the other side of the table, and, and at the same time, we kind of said, what are you doing here? And we suddenly discovered here we are. Steve's good friends with my sister's family and, and uh, both the, in the music world. And so it's just always a joy to come and, and be here and see Steve. Um, as we worship today, we know that God has blessed us with the living water. And the living water of the Spirit comes to us and, and allows us to drink of it much like the kids are drinking from their blue cup. And if I had only known that they would be so popular, I would have brought more and given them out to everyone. And, um, but the water of Christ that comes to us is a blessing. And sometimes we take that blessing for granted. And I don't want you to take it for granted ever again. So today, I've given some thought thinking about your new mission statement, which uh, I really like and the vision that you have for this community, a vision that needs to change and catch up with where we are today. And so I hope to be able to touch on some of those things. How many of you remember the old Jack Benny radio show? Anyone listen to it as a kid? Several of you. For those of you that are old enough to know that story, this doesn't matter to you, but for the rest of us, uh, back in the day, there was a time when there wasn't television or computers. Can you imagine that? Can't imagine that, can you? Well, families gathered around a radio and listened to radio shows, and that's how they got their entertainment. And so for those of you that are old enough to remember, and for those of you that are too young to even know this existed, I want to introduce you to Jack Benny this morning. Now, Jack Benny was thought of as one of the tightest men alive. He just didn't give away anything. And in one of his radio shows, there was a, a story about Jack, and he was being robbed at gunpoint. And maybe you remember this. It's called Your Money or Your Life. So let's see if we can listen to it. Hey, bud. Bud. Huh? Got a match? Matt? Yes, I have one right here. Don't make a move. This is a stick-up. What? You heard me. Mister, mister, put down that gun. Shut up. Now, come on. Your money or your life? <laughs> Look, bud. I said your money or your life. I'm thinking it over. <laughs> I'm thinking it over, your money or your life. Well, we kind of chuckle at that idea, but I would say to you as members and friends of First Presbyterian Church in Newcastle, hey, bud, your money or your life? Are you thinking it over? Well, I would encourage you not to think too long about this one. Now, I've been thinking about this question for a long time as a pastor. I think this is like my 30th year as a, as a pastor. And for a long time, I've been thinking about money and, and one's life. And I think I've come to the conclusion that the answer to this question of, hey, bud, your money or your life, is both. I'm going to give you both. If God's asking me that question, I'm going to give you both because I think God deserves both because God has given me both. And so, I share. Now, we all know that the economy today is somewhat unpredictable. It's 
up one day and then it creeps back down. It's kind of like gas prices, unfortunately. Up one day and they really creep down. Uh, I have to go to Ohio often to see my dad and I love a trip to Ohio so that I can fill up with gas because it's cheaper over there. It creeps down, it goes up, it changes often. We know that the economy today is in somewhat of a turmoil with the um, government shutting down and, and the debt crisis that we're in. We know that that's happening. But do you realize even though all of that's going on, unless you're a government employee and you don't have money right now, that you're continuing to spend and spend and spend because we live in a culture of consumerism. Our society is, has us resting on the pillars of property, profit, and power for existence. And even though they aren't really our inalienable rights, we keep pushing the idea that we need to acquire and own and make a profit. One comedian says that he buys things on the lay awake plan. Do you know the lay awake plan? You buy things and you lay awake at night wondering how you're going to pay for them. Not the way you want to live, is it? But that's where we are today. That's where we are. So when Jack Benny is asked your money or your life, or we're asked your money or your life, we think, gosh, I need all the money I can get so that I can buy and buy and buy and have and have and have and bigger and bigger and bigger, greater and greater and greater, nicer and nicer and nicer. Your money or your life. Now friends, the culture that we know today is a culture that's different than when Jack Benny was on the radio. Things have changed, we know that. The culture of Newcastle has changed over the last 20 or 30 years. You know that. This past week, I was up at Newcastle High School. Dan was there for a New Visions meeting. Have you heard of the New Visions program that's going on in Newcastle? There are community leaders that are looking at this community and asking themselves, do we want to continue living the way we're living or do we need to figure out a way to change things? Because if we don't change things, it's going to continue to be the way it is. And if we don't like the way it is and we just want to complain about it, guess what? We're part of the problem. Newcastle's not like it used to be. First Presbyterian Church is not like it used to be. If you go back in the 1950s, you had like a thousand members here. Look around. They're not here today, are they? The church as a whole has changed. It's not like it used to be in the 1950s. Now, in the October 11th, um, uh, the October 2011 issue of Presbyterians Today magazine, an issue that was titled Generous Living, there's our, our wonderful uh, articles, but one little thing that caught my eye was something called the changing landscape of giving. And what it was, was comparing the 1950s with today. And I, I want you to listen to some of what they came up with. In the 1950s, every respectable and upwardly mobile citizen was expected to be in church every Sunday morning. Does it make sense? Sure does, doesn't it? In the 1950s, stores were closed on Sundays. In the 1950s, when people moved into a new community, the first thing they did, not the second, third, or fourth, but the first thing they did was find a church home. In the 1950s, the phrase under God was added to the Pledge of Allegiance, and prayers were routinely offered in public schools. In the 1950s, the authority of the pastor in a local church was recognized in the community as well as within that particular church. By the way, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. Do you all celebrate that here? Elders, wherever you are, you need to jump on this. 
I was a pastor in Butler for 10 years, and one of the best things my congregation ever did to me, and I didn't even know Pastor Appreciation Month existed, and all of a sudden, one day, I show up on a Sunday in October, and they called me forward, and I'm a little anxious, wondering, you know, why in the world are they calling me forward? Is this it? Am I gone? They call me forward, and they hand me a, a, a gift. And I open the gift in front of the congregation, and every day during the month of October, someone in the life of that church had pledged to pray for me and my family. Do you know how powerful that is? At the same time, they gave me a gift certificate so that my family could go out and eat in places we would never have gone out to eat. Another church member came and said, I'd like for you to use our cottage up on Chautauqua Lake for the weekend. And the session has decided this is the weekend that you're taking off. Pastor Appreciation Month. Tell your pastor you love him. That's how you keep him. Even if you don't always agree with him, you love him. So I got off. That's not the 1950s. That's kind of my getting on a soapbox and preaching. So back to the 1950s. The role of church members, and this is important for you all, the role of church members in the 1950s was to help ministers do ministry. Help ministers do ministry. In the 1950s, there were no sports on Sunday morning. Remember that? And then back in the 1950s, stewardship, at least for many, was like paying dues. You just did it. Now, how about today? How have things changed? Today, societies at large could care less whether or not people are, are in church on a Sunday morning. Today, Sunday is the second busiest shopping day there is during the week. Today, if someone decides to join a church, it's only after a long process of doing research and, and thinking about whether they're going to join your church. They're looking at your website if you have one. They're looking at whether or not you are a church in conflict because, folks, nobody wants to join a church that fights with each other. Why do you think the Presbyterian church is getting smaller? Who would want to be a part of something like that? I do. But if I'm an outsider looking for a church, I'm looking for a place to feel loved and accepted, not a place that doesn't seem to like each other. Today, the focus of a church's mission and outreach is hands-on efforts, often but not always in the local community. Today, the role of the pastor is to equip ministers, uh, members to do ministry. No longer are you doing ministry alongside, you're equipping you to do it. And today, young people are busy on Sundays with soccer and volleyball and football and hockey, and the list goes on and on and on. The difference between 1950 until today, it's right there for us. And we look around and we wonder where have all the people gone? And we're asked the question, hey bud, your money or your life? So how do we respond? How do you respond as First Presbyterian Church in Newcastle? How does does the church as a whole respond to all of this? Now, in our scripture reading today from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the 12th through the 14th verses, uh, it provides for us a section called Unity and Diversity. Unity and Diversity. Listen again, just to a little bit of it. Just as a body, though one has many parts, which would be the unity part of it, but all its many parts form one body, the diversity part of it, so it is with Christ, the light part of it, which comes from your mission statement. For we were all baptized by one spirit, not many spirits, one spirit, and we were all given one spirit to drink, the spirit of Christ. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. 
So I ask you, what part of the body are you? What do you do in the life of this congregation that allows you to contribute? Now, uh, yesterday we celebrated homecoming at Westminster College. It was always, a, it's always a lot of fun. They start off the day with the 50th reunion group having worship together. And the pastor yesterday, whose first name is Neil, but I can't remember his last name, so I apologize to him. Uh, he said something that just jumped out at those who had gathered there. Now, remember, they graduated 50 years ago, so that would make them about how old? Any of you 50-year graduates? 72. 72. So most of them are what? Retired and old. Now, you're old only if you think you're old, but most of them were retired, or at least wanted to be retired. And he said, and, and folks, you can go look this up and see if it's real. Nowhere in the Bible does the word retired exist. It's not there. Nowhere does it exist. And so what that means for me is nowhere does it say, I've already done my time. I don't need to do that anymore. Anyone ever use that phrase when they're asked to be a part of a committee? Oh, I think there's some folks thinking that. It doesn't exist. We are all the body of Christ, and we've all been called to use our gifts. So what is your gift? Is your gift to greet people when they walk into your church? Now, I came here, I'm going to kind of give you a hard time here. I came here last year as the moderator of the presbytery. And as the moderator, I visited church, churches across this presbytery, and I would just show up on a Sunday morning. I never called and said it, told anyone I was coming. And I would just come in, and then I would, after church, I would write a note to the pastor saying, thanks for a good worship experience. If you'd like to hear about my experience, I'll let you know. Pastor Nathan wrote to me and asked me to tell him. Now, here's what I told him. I said, my wife and I arrived on Sunday morning. It was in the summertime, I believe. And we walked into the church, not knowing your building much. I wasn't quite sure where we needed to go. And so we, were, we came in the glass doors at the bottom of the steps leading to the parking lot. And we kind of stood there and said, well, I'm not sure. So we flipped the coin and decided to go up the steps. And there may be signage there, I'm not sure. And then we wandered back through your fellowship hall, which was nice. There were a few folks gathered in there. And then we came in and sat down and worshiped. What's my observation? When I walked in the door, it really would have been great to have been greeted by someone saying, hi, welcome to church. We're glad you're here. To get to our sanctuary, go up the steps, turn left, and then go on back to the, where you want to be. Now, what's your calling? Perhaps your calling is to be that greeter standing out there at that door. I'm just thinking it might help. Is your calling, because you can't get out and about much anymore, to, to make phone calls to congregation members and remind them of when meetings are scheduled? Or is it to make a phone call or write a note to someone who's at home sick? Or to send a birthday card? Is your calling to step up and teach a Sunday school class or serve on the session or be a member of the deacons? Is your calling to help out down at the rescue mission, or to go on a work trip, or to be part of your confirmation class. There's no such thing as the word retired in the body of Christ. Because the body has different arms, and different legs, and different ears, and different eyes, and different mouths, and we're all part of that body. Your mission talks about being unity. That's the unity part. The diversity part is that you all have different gifts, that you all can do different things. It's just a matter of what your calling is going to be. So when God calls and says, hey, bud, only put your name in the place of bud. And I don't know any of your names. I see Randy out there. Hey, Randy, your money or your life? How's Randy going to respond? Hey, Dan, your money or your life? How are you going to respond? Hey, Marty, Marty in the sound booth, I'm talking to you. Your money or your life? How are you going to respond? That's the question. The diversity part is the question. 
The answer is, we're going to respond as the body of Christ on this corner right here in this community that we love so dearly that, yes, we can be a part of and we can make a difference in. We're going to respond as the body of Christ because we've decided that we are his light in the city. His light in the city. God's light in the city. Jesus Christ's light in the city. We're going to respond together. Now, I want to close by sharing with you this little story. A man spoke to the Lord one day about heaven and hell. And the Lord said to the man, come, I'll show you hell. And so they walked together into this room and they, they entered the room and the man looked around and he saw a lot of people sitting in the room and, and there was this huge stew pot in the middle of the room. And everybody was sitting there and they looked desperate. They were famished. They were starving. And then the Lord said to the man, come on, I'll show you heaven. And so the Lord and this man walked to the next room. And the man looked around the room and it was identical to the first room. And just like in that first room, all the people there had a spoon so they could eat from that stew pot. Only in the first room, that, that, that spoon was longer than their arms. So when they got the soup, they couldn't get to their mouth. Now in this second room, they had the same spoon, just like the first room. The same spoon in that room. And the man said to the Lord, what's the difference? These people seem happy. Those people were starving. And the Lord said, in this room, they figured out that they could feed one another. My friends, you have been called by God to feed one another. To use the gifts that you've been given. To use your soup spoon and reach out and offer God's love to someone else as the body of Christ. How are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? How are you going to be his light in the city? Hey, bud, your money or your life? Together, I want you to say both. Together, both. I'm going to give you both, Lord. I'm going to give you my money, and I'm going to give you my life, and together we're going to be the body of Christ. We're going to be his light in the city right here in Newcastle, and we too are going to make a difference in the lives of the people that live here and live around us, the people who are part of this church and the people we've never, ever met. That's what it means to be a child of God. Now go forth and share that message and do something about it as the body of Christ. Let me pray. Lord God, we come to you as the body of Christ, one body, diverse as we are, with many members, knowing that you have called us, each of us, by name and said, I need you. I need you. So Lord, use us to be your servants. Use us to share your love with the world. Help this congregation to be your light here in the city. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Tithes and offerings, or you do that? I do it and then pray.
please join me in prayer. Lord, when we gather for worship, we come trying to put all that's going on in our lives behind us and, and in many ways run from it. When in fact, what we need to do is bring it to you. So Lord, we pray that you will hear our prayers today for family and friends who are struggling with needs. We pray for members of this congregation who are perhaps searching for a new job or uh, struggling with um, the loss of their job because of the government shutdown. We pray thinking about friends and family members perhaps who are off serving in the military and, and are away from home and we know that they are in your care and we, we trust that but we find ourselves anxious. Lord, we think about the calling upon our hearts as individuals and as a congregation to be your light here in the city. And, and we ask ourselves, what does that mean? What, what's it require of us? How can we actually do it? So we pray, seeking your wisdom, Lord, that you might continue to speak and guide this congregation as they try to be faithful. Be with the leaders of this congregation, the elders and the deacons and others who have been chosen to be part of the leadership team. Be with their, their board of trustees as together they work as a team in this congregation. Be with their pastor as he seeks to be faithful and tries to lead in the way that you've called him to lead. We pray that you will bring peace into this world we live in, Lord. When we look at places like Egypt and Somalia and Sudan and, and we continue to see the uprisings that occur, and we ask for your presence. We ask that people would turn to you rather than turning to guns. We ask that you would put faithful people in front of, of those government leaders or military leaders that have to make difficult decisions. And Lord, now I ask that you would listen to this congregation as silently they pray for family and friends, for those they know and those they'll never know who need to hear the message of your love. So hear our prayers, O oh God. And now we pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, as we prepare to go out to uh, some wonderful cake, I want to celebrate and honor with you all the birthday of Esther Salvage. Esther, wherever you are, happy birthday to you. What a wonderful day. Please join us for a good fellowship out in the, in, is it Galbraith Hall? Galbraith. Galbraith Hall. Friends, let's go forth. Never forget that God has called you, has given you a job because you can never retire from God because God's never going to retire from you. God has called you to something. And if you're trying to figure out what that is, ask an elder, ask a deacon, ask a trustee, ask your pastor, ask John. Where is he? Steve. John's brother is Steve. <laughs> Steve's brother is John. Steve. How about singing in the choir or directing a choir or teaching a Sunday school class? If you're searching for something, that's a great way to connect to the church. So do it. So now go forth in peace. Rejoice in the power of God's Holy Spirit for each of you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And together we say, Amen. Go forth in peace.